Welcome to Zcast, everyone. I'm Zia Scaravella from ZK Research, and I'm here in Dallas at the Extreme Connect 2024 event, uh, and I'm, which is Extreme's uh, annual user event, and I'm joined by uh, David Coleman, who's in the office of the CTO, but I know you more as Wireless Guru, so uh, just a, a quick bio on yourself, Dave. Uh, quick bio, I've been doing Wi-Fi for 25 plus years, was self-employed with my own consulting company for 10 years. Uh, Worked at Aerohive, a uh, startup Wi-Fi company for yeah. 10 years, and then came over to Extreme in that acquisition four years ago. In fact, a lot of what you see here with the Extreme Wi-Fi is Aerohive technology. Uh, it is, yeah. a, a good portion of it, and uh, and I've written a bunch of books on Wi-Fi. Yeah. So, uh, so. Well, I've I, noticed, uh, uh, and I called you Guru, because uh, every session I saw that you did here was packed, right? Like, uh, it was completely standing room only. So that obviously means it's a lot of customers interested in what you're doing too. Well, so. you know, it's, uh, Wi-Fi is a way of life and you use it in, you know, at work, at home, at play, and it's cool technology and our customers love it and they're interested in it. And so they want to learn more about it. And so yeah. I have the pleasure of talking about it. Yeah. And so, uh, you've been around Wi-Fi a long time. Just, you know, talk about the evolution of this before we get into some of the news from the show. Uh, Wi-Fi has been around a long time, mm -hmm. and you know I remember when I started my career and I was an engineer. Wi-Fi, there was always a choice, right? Do I do wireless and be mobile, or do I wired and have better connectivity? Right. But boy, it's come a long way since then, and, oh, uh, and, that, and right, and and now there's it's no choice because the performance is just as good. But just you know, go back in history a little. Talk about like all the things you've seen in Wi-Fi. Well, I mean it's. It's becoming ingrained in our culture, and to your point, the, the reason people like Wi-Fi uh, wi is mobility, right? Yeah. It gives them the freedom. So in the early days of Wi-Fi, where people first, their eyes lit up, is they realized that they didn't have to drag a need some net cord behind yeah. them everywhere yeah, yeah, they yeah. went, right? So and we all did that. Yeah, and we all did that, and we all did that. And, you know, initially, in, uh, you know, when it, in the early days, it was kind of, you know, it wasn't that much in the enterprise other than in, like some special use cases like manufacturing, for example, for yeah. data co um, collection. Um, but uh, it was more of a uh, on the consumer side, but then the consumers liked it at home so much that freedom and mobility, it started they finding its way into the enterprise. Yeah, the rogue APs. Yeah, the rogue are. APs actually forced the enterprise to deal with Wi-Fi, even though they didn't want to uh, do it, deal with it. So then WPA2 came out, uh, Wi-Fi security, um, uh, was fixed. Um, it's since been enhanced with WPA3. A uh, big, big paradigm shift was in 2009 when we got 802.11 in. And that's really when uh, we went from SISO radios to MIMO radios and a lot higher data speeds. And that's when the enterprise really started yeah. to embrace uh, Wi-Fi. Well, and and enterprise management too. So instead of doing a one box. Enterprise management. Yeah. Um, um, and then cloud came. Um, over those years, and then you know several gener more generations of Wi-Fi. But the, the really big paradigm shift started. Uh, next paradigm shift started a couple of years ago when we got Wi-Fi 6E, and not so much about all the new bells and whistles, but it's the spectrum that we got, the six gigahertz spectrum. That's a game changer, having uh, all that new spectrum available three times what we've had previously. Yeah, and so we've gone from 802.11n and things like that to calling now by numbers, and so yeah, we're at uh, Wi-Fi 6E yeah. and now seven. And, and so, so now we've got, we're at this point where we've got 6, 6E, 7. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see customers' heads mindsets at? What are, are they, if, if they're 5, obviously they might go to 7, but what kind of customers do you see deploying 6E versus 7? What's, what's the difference? That's a really good question. And actually, the way I get asked is, well, what, what should I buy right now? So my answer to a customer is, if you're in your refresh cycle, um, the way you future-proof yourself for the next five years and beyond is you need to make sure your infrastructure has a six gigahertz radio in it, okay? Now, and that could be 60 or it 7. It could be 60 or 7. Now, Wi-Fi 7 has a few new bells and whistles. Um, some of them are more consumer grade, like 4K QAM and 320 megahertz channels. There's some features like multi-leak operation that may be down the road. We'll have some uh, enterprise use cases and capabilities, but at the end of the day, I'm depending on the customer's budget, what they're trying to use the Wi-Fi for, I'm happy with them using either Wi-Fi 6E or 7 because they are future-proofing themselves with a six gigahertz radio. I almost consider Wi-Fi 7 as the next rev of Wi-Fi 6E, and it's continuing the story of what I'm calling the era of six gigahertz connectivity and mobility. 
Yeah, and now when the because there's not a lot of six gigahertz devices yet. Well, that's changing. Yeah, um, there's actually a lot of Wi-Fi six E devices, and that's been growing exponentially. Not a lot of Wi-Fi seven client devices yet. There's a okay. Google Pixel eight, uh, the newest Samsung. Uh, the Intel BE200 chip that's going to go into win Windows, but the, it's a smattering of Wi-Fi 7 clients, um, a lot more Wi-Fi 6E, but the good news is Wi-Fi 6E and 7 clients will continue that growth to drive uh, connectivity into 6 gigahertz. And so for customers thinking about uh, the 6 gigahertz spectrum, what kind of uh, bandwidth would one expect to get on a, on a device connected on 6E versus 6 Oh, you mean like that. throughput? Yeah, or, yeah. Well, it, it, it's really hard to say, so. Because I, I see all it, these it, theoretical maximums. Yeah, all right, so yeah. let's, let's just go back to Wi-Fi 7, for example. Yeah. You're going to hear that data rates of up to 46 gigabits per second. Yeah. First of all, data rates aren't the same thing as throughput, okay? So uh, because of medium contention, so divide that in half. And then, so now you're down to 23 gigabits per second. Do you really think you're going to get throughput of 23 gigabits no. per second? No. Okay, that's if you turn on every single feature in a Faraday cage and uh, Venus the, and Mars. Alive. And I'm on the only client. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and a unicorn walks in the room. But realistically, what would you um, get a gig? So yes, I think absolutely. I've already seen some uh, data rates of uh, data rates of five, six gigabits per second when you're actually you you'll be seeding a gig throughput uh, with a couple of clients. Um, there's also something, a feature in Wi-Fi 7 called MLO uh, aggregate. Yes. And if you're using that for a mesh, I've already seen uh, throughput and uh, capabilities of for mesh, not client to AP, but mesh, five gig uh, on a point to point kind so, of link. So that's interesting, and, I, and this you touched on this in the session you did yesterday. Um, what are the implications then to the wired network? Because most companies, there's a lot of gig out there, gig. Yeah. And whenever I've talked to customers about should I upgrade to multi gig or not, yeah. ah, you know, not really, because you're not really pushing it. Yeah. Uh, will this create the need to actually do a wired refresh? I think so. For at, at the very least, for future proofing yourself. So for ten years, I've been hearing that you need to uh, the one gig uplink at the access layer was a bottleneck. And for 10 years, it's been marketing hype other than corner cases. But I can confidently say now with tri-frequency APs and now with the advent of Wi-Fi 7 too, with even higher data rates, you need to start thinking about a, a multi-rate. Um, I'm not saying you need to do the refresh on the switching wire side right away, but you're going to probably need to do it for a future proofing exercise. The more important conversation on the wire side is the power over Ethernet. Yeah. Uh, because the... Three radios are going to need more power. Two by two by twos are going to need uh, uh, PoE plus, and four by four by fours are going to need 802.3 uh, VT power of 30, yeah. 32 watts and more. Yeah. And so speaking of power, you had some news at the event, right? That yes. Had to do with power. A different so, kind of power. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so so talk about that. And, okay. Yeah. So we uh, we put out a press release yesterday. Although they're related, I guess in some ways. You still yeah, need a little power. bit. Yeah. But, uh, is so with Wi-Fi six, um, and, excuse me, six and seven, or I should say six gigahertz in six general. Gigahertz, yeah. In the United States, there's very specific classifications for devices um, and amount of power you can use. So far, for the last couple of years, has been an indoor play only, using what's called low power indoor. There hasn't been outdoor ca capability for six gigahertz. Yeah. We can do that now legal in the United States because the FCC is now allows for what's called standard power, which also allows us to, um, it's a different classification, it's higher power, and also allows for outdoor use uh, in six gigahertz for the first which time. Which you could not do before. Which you could not do before. Which I know when the Giants rolled out, San Francisco Giants rolled out their 6E, they were very careful to use the term 6E ready. Yes. infrastructure, right? That's correct, yeah. because they deployed our AP 5050s. Uh, they turned on the 2.4 and 5, but legally they could not turn on uh, the 6 gigahertz yet because the FCC rulings for using standard power outdoor 6 gigahertz weren't not available. The good news is we got our a shiny little certificate to do that last Friday, 
And we're, as we're talking, we have thousands of APs and customers that already have those APs deployed outdoors, and they are in the process of lighting up six gigahertz outdoors as we speak. And can you talk about any of those customers and what they're, they're uh, expecting? I think in our press release, you already mentioned one, Oracle yeah. Park, and also in our press release, we mentioned Cedar Fair. And then we have- Which is a big amusement park. Big amusement yeah. park, and then we also have multiple other uh, yeah. customers that are in stadiums, because as you will well know, uh, Extreme is well known for uh, yes. arena and stadium Wi-Fi. Yeah, and that, so. and I find those environments, uh, those are interesting because those may be the most challenging. Well, you, you know, you're big in airports and schools. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the arenas and stadiums are very challenging. Well, I'm you, glad you brought that up because it's it. And not everybody does it well. In, in, you're correct. So if you put 50, 60,000 people crammed into a stadium, that's the hardest design. Yeah. for a, a Wi-Fi. It's not easy. It takes a lot of planning and a lot of uh, post pre-deployment and po post-deployment and monitoring. At Extreme, I'm proud to say we've become experts at it. So I like to brag um, that if you can become master of the art of arena Wi-Fi, you can master the art of Wi-Fi in any vertical and anywhere in the world. Yeah, and I have noticed that and I just, for people watching, I, I go to a lot of stadiums and I always test the Wi-Fi. And in general, if it's an Extreme deployment, I'm pretty confident it's going to work well. well thank and I've you. talked to some of the stadium CIOs, and it's, in some ways, you know, you could argue your tech's better than your competitor, but you all use the same chips in a way. But they, they do talk about the amount of pre-work yes. that Extreme does to help them figure out the nuances, especially of like a Fenway Park or a Wrigley Field or a Dodger Stadium yeah. that weren't designed with Wi-Fi in mind, no. right? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Fenway Park with those small seats, yeah. you know. And there's metal and concrete yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah but yet it still works in those environments. Yes. And so not only do you work in the most demanding environments, you work in the most complicated of those demanding environments. In fact, if you look at all the old iconic stadiums, London Stadium, mm -hmm. Old Trafford Park, as I mentioned, Dodger, Wrigley, Fenway, Lambeau, they're all extreme customers. So, yes, yeah. and, and we're very proud of that. Yeah. And, and once again, just to circle back about our press release, we're very excited because um, yeah. right now this is only in the United States for the standard power. We, it'll spread to Canada. I was going to ask that next. Where, where, where do you see that going globally? Canada next, hopefully, yeah. uh, this year. And then we'll see um, what happens with the rest of the world. So, so, so we're this close, though, on the verge of having 60 everywhere. Or well, 60 gigahertz everywhere. It's 6 gigahertz everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, but the rules and regulations are yeah. different. We need what I call what we call spectrum harmonization. We're very lucky here in North America to have all 1,200 megahertz of frequency space and now have standard power. It's going to take some time to grow that um, across the world, but uh, in big portions of the world, we have at least parts of the 6 gigahertz spectrum available in, mo in like Europe and Asia. Um, Standard power in some of those other parts of the world might take a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, just one more question. Uh, sure. Uh, I do know, so now you're thinking you need more power to power it, mm -hmm. right? And so the sustainability issues, but I also know you're working on some advanced capabilities to be able to manage like PoE better and be able to, yeah. you know, so, so, because so, yeah. you mentioned Europe and I, I was thinking about their hesitation to upgrade because mm -hmm. it's because now I got to upgrade my wired yeah, yeah. network and so, you know, it's but you can make the network more sustainable. So it, right? it's interesting. So it, it, it's technologies that were, were things, sustainability, things that we're looking at yeah. and how to solve problems. So to your point, with the newer APs, they need more power and more power draw. So as an industry as a whole, we're going to have to get smarter about managing power and sustainability. And like you mentioned in Europe, they actually have mandates for corporations to conserve power. So we're going to have to look at things like better monitoring of power, um, dynamically um, powering down APs when they're not in, in use or heavy use, um, actually reporting capabilities about kilowatt hour saved and things like that. These are the kind of things networking vendors in general, including Extreme, are all looking at. And as part of our society, we're going to have to deal with. Good, good. All right. Anything else you want to add? I just want to say one more thing about the whole standard power yeah. thing. It's, it is a little bit different for Wi-Fi because it comes under the control of something called automated frequency right, coordination, AFC, yeah. um, where the APs actually have to check in once a day with their geolocation to, as a proactive service to say, oh. I'm not interfering with some existing incumbents. So, um, and so that's, we are working with our partner, Wi-Fi Alliance and Services that are our AFC provider. And um, 
and it's kind of new technology, so it's fun. And uh, so it's fun for Wi-Fi geeks like myself, and, yeah. and, uh, and hopefully it'll be fun for our customers as well, because not only will we be providing six gigahertz connectivity indoors, but now outdoors. So this is uh, an important part though, that standards base actually here has a lot of advantages, because there's always some companies that like to do things a little bit proprietary or whatever, but right. working with the Wi-Fi Alliance in a standard-based way actually. And, and they actually built, uh, built it on what's called the uh, Open AFC platform, which is an open platform yeah. as opposed to a closed system. Yeah, oh, that's so, good then. So, awesome. All right. All right. Uh, that was great. Always a pleasure, yeah, my friend. Yeah, thanks, thanks Dave. So on behalf of David Coleman from Extreme Networks and Zias Caraval from ZK Research, saying thanks for watching. Uh, please hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you next time on my next episode of Zcast.